Greetings and salutations everyone, my name is Andrew Kirikoff and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to be talking about all the fantasy football 2019 news that you can possibly handle. There were a bunch of free agent signings earlier today, March 11th of 2019, also a couple trades sprinkled here and there, but the NFL is booming. It's literally Christmas in March and I couldn't be happier because we're getting old faces in new places, players are switching teams. Uh, in order to perhaps give themselves, for me in my opinion, some more fantasy value as we approach the 2019 fantasy football season. So that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the implications on specific players moving to different teams and uh, what my opinions on those matters are. So without further ado, let's get right into that, shall we? Hey everybody, how's it going? Hope everyone's doing well. All right, so as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about a couple names here and there, a couple of the players that, you know, We'll be wearing different jerseys come the start of the 2019 season. So, as you saw from the thumbnail, uh, my first player that I really want to talk about is Nick Foles. I mentioned this a couple weeks back in my podcast, um, talking about Florida Foles and that he was going to sign with the Jacksonville Jaguars because, to be honest, uh, there wasn't another organization that made sense uh, for his particular situation. Um, looking at all the other organizations that are in need of a quarterback, um, Really, there, there really wasn't one that kind of stood out. Obviously, the Redskins were another uh, team that was kind of sought after for perhaps a destination for Nick Foles. But since he's been playing with the Eagles the last couple seasons, um, everyone kind of had a creeping suspicion that he did not want to stay within the division and he was going to go ahead <clears throat> and depart. And he's going to Florida to play for the Jacksonville Jaguars. So what are my opinions, my thoughts on the matter? Okay, Here's the thing. We all know... Nick Foles, when he gets to the playoffs, he's the man, the myth, you know, he's he's the Super Bowl MVP from 2017. So um, here's the thing. A lot of people might be thinking, ah, oh, Foles is an overrated quarterback. You know, he's out of his prime. We, we shouldn't really trust him. The fact of the matter is, Nick Foles is only 30 years old, okay? And to put this into perspective, Carson Wentz is 26. So if you can imagine, you know, Nick Foles isn't that old of a quarterback, you know, we still have guys like Tom Brady who are 41 playing in this league. We have Drew Brees is playing in this league. So it's not, you know, too crazy to say that Nick Foles can definitely lead a team to the playoffs if they construct a balanced team surrounding him. And that's really the question. Can the Jacksonville Jaguars add pieces around him in order to give him fantasy value and or for him to increase the value of the players that surround him. So let's talk about that particularly, right? I talked about this a little bit in uh, a couple weeks back, but I'll go into a little bit more detail now. Obviously, Nick Foles is an improvement on uh, Blake Bortles and Cody Kessler, the combination of the two that played for the Jacksonville Jaguars last season. Now, that being said, Blake Bortles had a couple good games here and there. Um, he was able to use his athleticism to get fantasy points uh, with his legs a couple rushing touchdowns, had about 300 rushing yards last season. So he had a couple, you know, good games due to that. Also, because of the fact that the Jacksonville Jaguars were often getting blown out last season uh, because of their inability to score, the fact of the matter was, you know, Bortles was getting garbage time points. And when the defense has pulled out their starters and Bortles was able to put points on the board, he, he looked like a decent fantasy quarterback, which really wasn't the case because in reality, we all know Blake Bortles, not so good. <clears throat> so here's the thing. What is the identity of the Jacksonville Jaguars? They're a run-first team. We know that that's what they have established offensively. Defensively, I mean, in my opinion, this is a defensive-minded team. The head coach is a defensive-minded head coach. As of right now, this team, they want to run the ball, they want to eat clock, and then they want to put their defense on the field in order to make plays. And I think they'll be able to do that with Nick Foles rather than Kessler and Bortles who are completely just lost out there sometimes when they continuously turn over the ball, um, which I don't think, I mean, which I won't think <clears throat> Foles is going to be able to, you know, just throw the ball away. I think he's a more experienced quarterback as we've seen. And to be honest, uh, I don't think he's going to be prone to making the mistakes that Bortles and Kessler did this past season. That being said, he is going into a pretty good defensive uh, division, the AFC South, with the Colts, who defensively looked great this last season, Tennessee Titans, the Houston Texans. Those are some defenses that you don't really want to mess around with. That being said, um, Nick Foles is going into a team in which in 2018 had the second lowest points per game average amongst all NFL teams. They only scored 15.3 points per game, which was only ahead of the the Cardinals. 
So obviously the Jacksonville Jaguars, they need some weapons in order to help this team. Because if offensively they can stay with teams, their defense is going to win them games. And that's exactly what they want to do. Now, when we talk about the fantasy perspective of how we we value Nick Foles, as of right now, if you play in a 12-team league in which you can only start one quarterback, Nick Foles is probably not even going to be rostered after the, the initial draft. I think Nick Foles, uh, unless he is to you know make some ridiculous performances here and there and become a consistently good quarterback, I don't even think he'll be rostered in majority of leagues come this season because uh, there really aren't many weapons for him to use. Leonard Fournette and this team, they are a run first and run heavy team. Other than that, you know, you have D.D. Westbrook, Keelan Cole, two young receivers um, in their third year. Um, I mean, tight end position, unless they want to bring back Austin Seferi and Jenkins. Uh, just there, there really isn't much talent there. They might bring back uh, Dante Moncrief, but offensively, they don't have many passing uh, weapons for Nick Foles to use which is unfortunate. So looking at it, I probably don't see him having much value there. Now, if you do play in my favorite type of league, a two quarterback or a super flex league, um, Nick Foles is going to be rostered because majority of teams are going to have those two starting quarterbacks and that third quarterback sitting on the bench for bye weeks and or matchup purposes. Now, that's probably where I see Nick Foles having the most value. Um, Obviously, only time will tell, depending on what kind of free agent moves this team makes in order to help Nick Foles in this offense, but um, you probably shouldn't worry if you're playing in a 12-team league. Uh, The only thing that this kind of does is it helps Leonard Fournette. Uh, Personally, I think Leonard Fournette, (laughs) if you want to get value out of him, you got to keep him on the field, and you've got to get into the red zone in order for him to put down his head and get into the the end zone in order to get you points. So uh, I think... Nick Foles gives them a better opportunity of doing that this season, and uh, it should be exciting. So congratulations to Nick Foles, and let's go ahead and move on to the next guy I wanted to talk about. We'll just go from the south on up. We're going to go, we're going to talk about the newest member of the Tennessee Titans, Adam Humphreys, um, receiver for, well, you know, he used to be the receiver for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Interesting thing, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they lost two receivers today. Um, Adam Humphreys, due to free agency, went over to the Tennessee Titans and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers also traded away Deshaun Jackson uh, to the Eagles. So he's going back to Philadelphia, which we'll get into a little bit later. But let's talk about Adam Humphreys and his value, okay? Now, a couple couple stats that I pulled from last season, right? In 2018, in half-point PPR scoring formats, okay, in the second half of the regular season, Adam Humphreys was only outscored by these receivers. Are you ready for it? There's a couple names, but it's all good. Julio Jones, Amari Cooper, Devontae Adams, Tyreek Hill, T.Y. Hilton, DeAndre Hopkins, Julian Edelman, Keenan Allen, Robert Woods, Michael Thomas, Antonio Brown, Juju Smith, and Mike Evans. So, those were the only receivers that outscored Adam Humphreys in the second half of the 2018 fantasy football season. Can you believe that? That leaves him in pretty elite company, okay? This guy was able to rack in a bunch of targets, receptions, touchdowns in the second half of the season. And like I mentioned, also Mike Evans was in on that list and scoring, um, what, at, in the top 14 amongst receivers in the second half of the 2018 season. So obviously, um, their production was not mutually uh, exclusive, right? It, it didn't. Uh, pertain to, oh, if Mike Evans is going off, then Adam Humphreys is not going to get much value out of it, or the other way around. These guys were both great because of the fact that Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they like to throw the ball. And playing in that division in the uh, <clears throat> NFC uh, South against the Saints, against the Falcons, against the Panthers, I mean, those are shootouts. And uh, Adam Humphreys, you know, benefited a lot from that. Another stat that I pulled from last season. Adam Humphreys was, uh, had the fifth most receiving yards um, from the slot position in the NFL. The fifth most. I think the only other people above him were uh, some, some pretty good names. The Jujus were up there. Um, pretty good receivers. Also, he had 42 first down receptions, which was ranked number one amongst all slot receivers. And also, he had 52 receptions from the slot position, which was number one. Sorry, he was tied for second in 2018 amongst all wide receivers. So, I mean, goodness gracious, uh, Adam Humphreys is a slot monster. He played fantastic last season. But what is he going to do in Tennessee? 
Can Marcus Mariota and again another one of these run first teams um, can they figure it out and can they get Adam Humphrey the ball in order to make him fantasy relevant? We saw him with Jameis Winston last year have a lot of value. Uh, the reason he's going to Tennessee it's probably because of the fact that they're giving him about nine million per year. It's pretty it's a it's a pretty big chain uh, chunk of change right there for a slot receiver that you know has only four years of uh, experience in the NFL and really uh, until this year didn't really show much. Uh, had a couple decent seasons, about 600 receiving yards in 2017, but this last season uh, really stepped up and was a big contributor to the offense of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Now, as I was saying, other than guys like Corey Davis, uh, Delaney Walker coming back from a season-ending injury last season, um, Deion Lewis out of the backfield, there really wasn't uh, or isn't going to be a receiving option within this offense. Ty- Taewon Taylor, I mean, can we trust him? Not really. So Corey Davis, he's a bigger target. Great. He'll get the red zone targets. He'll get a couple third down uh, comeback routes or throw ups that they can just, you know, 50 50 ball with him. So Lanny Walker coming back obviously helps Marcus Mariota. Maybe if Derrick Henry wants to just be consistent throughout the entire season, which I doubt that's going to be the case, um, that can kind of set precedent there. But Adam Humphreys in the slot. He's one of the best to do it at the position. And uh, the Tennessee Titans, you know, they got themselves the best slot um, that was on the market as of right now. So that's good for them. It's good for Marcus Mariota. And hopefully, you know, I'm I'm pretty high on Adam Humphreys. I was high on him when he was on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers because of how much I know that offense loves to run the ball. I mean, pass the ball, excuse me, in Tampa Bay. Uh, (laughs) Freudian Freudian slip right there. Um, Tampa Bay really loves to throw the ball, especially in that division. So, uh, with Jameis Winston, I had a you know I had him pretty highly ranked in that mock draft I did a little earlier this season. I had him pretty high. So uh, looking at it right now, uh, probably I'd have his value just a little bit lower because of the fact that I know Marcus Mariota not the best quarterback. Okay, consistently um, just hasn't been great. His injuries that plagued him last season are is not the only season in which he's uh, missed a good chunk of time due to injuries. Um, so how much can we trust a slot receiver on a team that loves to run the ball? Uh, I don't know. But to be honest, I think Adam Humphreys, he's going to be a low-end, uh, probably a high-end wide receiver three going into this season uh, in that range. So hopefully we'll, we'll see how that goes. But we can't talk about Adam Humphreys all day. Let's go ahead and move on. Let's talk about other additions. Again, we're moving up. So we're going to go to Chicago, Illinois, to talk about Mike Davis running back for the Seattle Seahawks. Okay, A guy that contributed a lot last year to the Seahawks offense. You, as many of us know, the Seahawks um, throughout the entire NFL had the second most rushing attempts amongst all teams. Number one was the Ravens, obviously because Lamar Jackson came in early or late in the season and ran the ball a ton. Right? He had a game with... 20 plus rushing attempts. Obviously, that kind of skewed it, but they led the league in rushing yards with 20, uh, 2,560 yards, 2,560 yards. And the Seattle Seahawks were, were just dominating when it comes to the run game. Uh, Mike Davis contributed here and there when Chris Carson uh, had his, you know, his back injury that kind of kept him out a couple games here and there. In that time, he had. Uh, 112 carries, uh, Mike Davis did 112 carries for 534 re- uh, rushing yards, excuse me. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, no, I'm sorry. He had 112 carries for 514 rushing yards, four rushing touchdowns, and had 34 receptions for 214 receiving yards, one receiving touchdown. Um, he was primarily the receiving back of the Seattle Seahawks. Um, Rashad Penny did not contribute much in that game. Rashad Penny did not contribute much overall. Um, Chris Carson dominated the run game, and uh, Mike Davis had a lot of the passing work and some, you know, um, some work in the run, uh, the rushing department here and there because of the fact that this team loved to run the ball so much. You know, you couldn't just continue to feed the ball to Carson because uh, he was just gonna he was gonna get hurt, and it was eventually going to break him down. So they had to use Mike Davis more. Now, what exactly does this do for the Chicago Bears? This, in my opinion, without a shadow of a doubt in my mind. This establishes that Jordan Howard's gone. Jordan Howard will be gone. He will no longer be a Chicago Bear within the coming days, weeks. 
Okay, we know we talked about it in weeks prior that Jordan Howard is on the block. They have made it apparent that they are trying to trade Jordan Howard um, because they like what they saw from Tariq Cohen last season, and they brought in Mike Davis to be that early down running back in which you know they don't have to pay him as much they, that uh, Jordan Howard is going to want to be paid. So you know, might as well ship Jordan Howard, make sure some of that money kind of stays home. And uh, get some picks for him. Because, honestly, Jordan Howard's becoming a bowling ball at this point. Uh, and he's not looking great. So, obviously, he has some games in which he produces fantasy-wise. And that's often when he finds the, the end zone and scores that extra six points here and there. But, uh, anyway, bringing in Mike Davis. Um, this only helps Tariq Cohen's value. Because Mike Davis isn't going to be able to uh, <laughs> carry as many times as Jordan Howard did in the last couple seasons. So, Tariq Cohen will get more yards. Get more attempts, get more you know opportunity here, which is fantastic for him. And uh, Jordan Howard will be gone, and probably or hopefully on a team in which he can find fantasy value, so that we have more opportunity um, to to grab value around the league. So anyway, that's Mike Davis, a uh, newest addition to the Chicago Bears. Moving on to the team to the right, going into Indianapolis, talking about the Colts signing Devin Funches on a one-year, thirteen million dollar deal this season. Goodness gracious. Ah, Devin Funches? Really? Devin Funches? He's a bigger target. He's had some decent performances. Last season, 2018, when he started out the season, he was good. Four out of his six performances were 11 or more half-point PPR fantasy points. He had like an 11-point game, um, a 14 and two 15s. F- uh, within the first, uh, f- four out of the first four, six games. Sorry, yeah, four out of the first six games. He had four pretty good performances. And then all of a sudden, he gets the injury bug. Cam Newton's arm is looking like trash. He himself doesn't personally play well, um, especially into juicy matchups. So they played against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, in which he should have had a ton of points because the Buccaneers, at a time in uh, last season, were giving up the most points to the wide receiver position consistently every week. And there were just a lot of uh, situations in which Devin Funches wasn't able to perform. Now, he is going to a... Indianapolis Colts team in which he's not going to be the first option, the second option, or even the third offensive option within this team. Because we already have T.Y. Hilton, who, you know, uh, T.Y. Hilton and Andrew Luck drafted in the same year, 2012. Both of them have been fantastic together throughout their entire career, um, make each other better without a doubt. They've got Marlon Mack, who established himself after he came back from injury last season, uh, injury plagued first what, four of the first five games of his uh, 2018 season. As soon as he got back, he has some fantastic performances, and he he showed that he is the number one running back for that team, and he has a lot of value in 2019. Other than that, we have Eric Ebron, Jack Doyle. Eric Ebron, whether Jack Doyle is there or not, I've been doing some stat lookups. Goodness gracious, I'll, I'll go ahead and spout one off for you guys. When Jack Doyle was healthy and playing, Eric Ebron only played 18% of offensive snaps, well, Jack Doyle played just about 54%, if I'm not mistaken. Somewhere in the mid-lower um, 50s. Um, I don't have the stat in front of me because it's in a Word doc somewhere. <laughs> anyway, um, in those games in which Jack Doyle was healthy and playing, he had scored just around 45 fantasy points and half-point PPR on about 50% of the offensive snaps at the tight end position. While Eric Ebron only playing 18% of the offensive snaps scored 77 fantasy points. Nearly 35 more fantasy points with a whopping only 18% of offensive snaps at the tight end position. Eric Ebron's a monster. Jack Doyle's a monster. We know Andrew Luck loves to throw the ball to the tight end. So where does Jack Doyle fit in this offense? He's just going to be a solid wide receiver too, which really I don't think he's going to see the ball often. Um, the Colts, they love to throw the ball. They, I think... Um, if I'm not mistaken, amongst all teams in the NFL, uh, they had the second most passing attempts last season. So they're going to throw the ball a lot. That is a given. Andrew Luck is their number one weapon, and they want to use his arm as much as they possibly can, without a doubt in their mind. So Devin Funches could have value, but um, only time will tell because I honestly don't think he's... He, in my opinion, after the, the Hilton, the Mack... The Ebron Doyle duo, he's the next option. So it, it, there's about four names in front of him before he can see some targets here and there. I could be mistaken, but 
I don't put too much stock into that. Anyway, let's go ahead and move on. Let's talk about the next name on our list because we can't be here all day. All right, Deshaun Jackson, going back to Philadelphia, was traded earlier today from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers back up to Philly. <sighs> okay, what does this do? I think um, Deshaun Jackson's value, wide receiver three, that or maybe even four, just depends. Um, really, I mean, he, he's older. He's lost a step. Yes, he's still fast. And I think that's going to help because the Philadelphia Eagles last season they wanted to address their speed at the, at their wide receiver core position. You know, <clears throat> at their wide receiver core, they brought in Mike Wallace. What happened to Mike Wallace? Well, he missed majority of the season because he broke his foot. After he left, they tried to fill the position. They brought in Jordan Matthews, uh, and they tried to figure it out. They they were able to find um, some pieces here and there, but bringing back Deshaun Jackson, it opens up that offense. It spreads it out to the point where you have to. Put a safety over the top when Deshaun Jackson is running a nine route straight down the field or a post over the middle in which you have to respect it. He has still got speed. He's still got talent. And I think this only helps Carson Wentz to give him another weapon within this offense. It helps Alshon Jeffrey. Um, and to be honest, I think it helps Nelson Aguilar. I think it helps the entire wide receiver core. Um until we figure out who the running back of the Seagulls team is, I, I mean, it's, it looks like it's an RBBC. It's a running back by committee. But overall, I think Deshaun Jackson uh, coming into the Eagles organization for the second time, he presents a lot of value to Carson Wentz and to Alshon Jeffrey specifically because if if they've got to respect Deshaun Jackson with his speed and they got to put a safety over the top, uh, that's going to leave Alshon Jeffrey to a lot of one-on-one matchups which honestly I prefer over anything because he's a 6'5 wide receiver, big hands, strong wide receiver that's going to make separation between him and the corner, uh, and he's going to make a lot of plays. So anyway, those are my thoughts on Deshaun Jackson. Uh, Let's move over to the Great Lakes. Let's talk about Jesse James um, going from the Pittsburgh Steelers. We were in Philadelphia, and we move over to Pittsburgh. Then we jump all the way over to Detroit, Michigan, where we have Jesse James going to the Detroit Lions. Now, here's my initial thoughts. And really, I don't really want to go into it much because Jesse James going to the uh, going to the <clears throat> excuse me, going to the Detroit Lions helps Vance McDonald. Oh goodness, this helps Vance McDonald. I think this perhaps establishes him as a top top top. But I, I don't know why I'm stuttering here. Uh, this establishes him as a top 12 tight end going into the season. We've seen a lot of shitty tight end play in the last couple seasons. Um, and hopefully the departure of Jesse James from the Pittsburgh Steelers offense, the departure of Antonio Brown, it opens up opportunity for a guy like Vance McDonald to step up. And I think that's what's going to take place here uh, because he won't have to split snap, snaps with Jesse James. Now, what value does Jesse James have going into the 2019 fantasy football season? Well, I don't think he has much. The Lions don't like to use the tight end position. Even when Eric Ebron was there, they brought in um, to- um, yeah, Toy Lolo last year. Who else? Um, Luke Wilson from the Seahawks last season. They've, they've, they've br- brought in and they've had decent tight ends. And did they use their tight end position? Absolutely not. That is not the case. Unless they go ahead and try to trade for Gronk like they did in the beginning of last season. Not going to happen. I really don't think Jesse James, other than the fact that he is a bigger target, 6'8", tight end, down at the goal line, I mean, I, whew, I don't I don't see him having much value. I think he's just another one of these garbage tight ends that we're all going to hope has a couple good weeks here for us in 2019, but only time will tell. I just I don't trust the talent, and I don't trust the opportunity because really the, the Lions have a pretty bad reputation with feeding their tight end position. Um, in the last couple seasons, and it just doesn't look promising. So anyway, let's move on. Let's go into New York where we have two teams, the Jets and the Buffalo Bills, who made some moves today. All right, specifically, let's talk about the Jets. Uh, Jamison Crowder, formerly Washington Redskin wide receiver, has moved on. He is signed by the Jets today. Now, here's the thing. Jamison Crowder, we all know he is primarily a slot wide receiver, period, just like Adam Humphreys. Sure, he can play on the outside a little bit here and there, but uh, he is not going to be asked to do that. He is going to be a slot receiver. That being said, the Jets offense loves throwing the ball to the, to the slot receiver position. We saw Quincy and Nuno find a lot of success early on in the 2018 fantasy football season because of the fact that uh, Sam Darnold found a rapport with him and in the slot position, he was just 
He was finding himself open. Now, I think Jamison Crowder, even though he did not perform very well last season, we've seen him perform well in the past 2017, 2016. Um, with an ample amount of targets, he can find fantasy value for many teams. We know that. So going into the season, hopefully he can go ahead and connect with Sam Darnold, who loves to throw the ball to the slot position. If I'm not mistaken, uh, the statistic is uh, the Jets threw the ball to the slot position. Um, I think that they were the 12th ranked team amongst all 32 teams to throw the ball to the slot position last season. So, um, you know, obviously Sam Darnold trying to still polish up his skills, throwing short uh, balls here and there to trusted receivers like Quincy Inunua, and now it's going to be Jamison Crowder. So hopefully he can find some success and some fantasy value because, I mean, <laughs> Jamison Crowder really last season was just, he was a ghost. Didn't do anything last year. So hopefully we can turn that around, change the script. All right. Uh, oh, also, really quick, I wanted to mention, the Jets are kind of making some sneaky moves here and there, okay? Um, other than bringing in Jamison Crowder, they're, they're kind of, uh, with the new leadership of uh, Adam Gase at their head coach position, even though I do not like Adam Gase, I think he did a terrible job um, last season with the Dolphins. I mean, that the entire situation of Frank Gore getting more reps over Kenyon Drake on a consistent weekly basis is appalling, and it is just unbelievable. And I'm scared for whatever running back ends up being the starting running back and backup running back for the Jets because there is going to be... A problem there because if Kenyon Drake as talented as he is is not getting consistent amount of reps and attempts per game and Frank Gore is beating him out there's a problem and even I mean Kenyon Drake was fantastic last year even with the limited amount now but that being said the Jets they brought in Kelechi Osimile uh left guard all pro um I think he was a two-time all pro from the Raiders I talked about the Raiders the other day with Antonio Brown uh Kelechi Osimile did not play well last season. Even though he's been an All-Pro, uh, according to Pro Football Fo- Focus, he had about a 58.2 uh, overall score, which was absolutely terrible. Um, the Oakland Raiders were deciding to move on. They traded him away uh, to the Jets. The Jets go ahead. They pick up themselves a hopeful um, All-Pro guard that can return to form. That that would be fantastic in order to help protect their franchise quarterback, uh, Sam Darnold there. On top of that, news came out a little bit earlier uh, that Anthony Barr will sign with the Jets. I know there's a couple other defensive players like uh, Landon Collins going to the Redskins, Tyron Matthew going to the Chiefs. There's a lot of noise making uh, the uh, the rounds right now. So we'll go into that a little bit later because right now we're talking about 2019 fantasy football and those defensive players, yes, offensive linemen make a difference, but defensive players, not so much. So anyway, let's get to the end of this video where we talk about Tyler Croft and Frank Gore becoming Buffalo Bills today. All right, so like I mentioned, Frank Gore was getting more rushing attempts per game, close I mean, close to more rushing attempts per game than Kenyon Drake last season. And it was absolutely frustrating for all Kenyon Drake owners. Now, he is not playing under the uh, leadership of Adam Gase. He's going to Buffalo, in which he's going to contribute into a backfield which has Chris Ivory and LaShawn McCoy. This is a little worrisome. I think... The Bills bringing in a guy like Frank Gore um, says a lot. It says that, hey, we really don't care who's going to be our starting running back. We are going to run the ball with a, a committee. We think that LaShawn McCoy perhaps doesn't have as much value unless they decide to trade him. And uh, Frank Gore, yes, he's a veteran running back that can still play. Absolutely can still play. Had a couple good games last season. I think he had a game in which he ran for over 100 yards. Um, so even though he's... I think what, in his 19th year? No, that's a joke. He's probably in his like 13th, 14th season. Um, He's still looking good. So running back position, I think this absolutely hurts LeSean McCoy unless Frank Gore is, you know, to be limited to only uh, getting the ball a couple times per game. But you you never know. We'll see what uh, that turns into. Other than that, Tyler Croft. Uh, Earlier this offseason, the tight end for the Buffalo Bills, longtime tight end, Charles Clay, was go ahead. They went and uh, released him. He was signed by the Arizona Cardinals um, in order to fill his position. They had about, I think they had Kroom, the tight end Kroom, really didn't produce much last year. They brought in Tyler Croft, who was the second string tight end for the Cincinnati Bengals. Now, where is Tyler Croft getting all this money from? Why is he getting paid almost six, seven, eight million dollars a year uh, to come play for Buffalo? Tyler Croft has proven that he can be a 
pretty viable tight end and red zone threat um, because majority of the seasons or the last couple seasons in Cincinnati, Tyler Eifert could not stay healthy. Yes, another Tyler, but Tyler Eifert could not stay healthy to save his life. The last three seasons have been just detrimental to his career. Injuries left, right, and center. I don't even know if the Cincinnati Bengals are going to bring him back. But they went ahead and uh, the Buffalo Bills signed Tyler Croft, bigger target, who has found success with Andy Dalton in 2017. Um, had what? I think if I'm not mistaken, I think Croft had 10 t- uh, touchdowns that year. Um, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, here we go. Thank you very much. Seven touchdowns in that season in which he had 42 receptions, 404 yards. Not terrible. He's a red zone threat. Now, <clears throat> in the grand scheme of tight ends, does that even present value? Especially when your quarterback's uh, Josh Allen? Not really. But I guess we'll only have to wait and see. There's other um, free agents that moved around. I'm going to make a separate video on Carlos Hyde and Damian Williams and the, uh, the implications of that. But that's pretty much it. Um, talked about these players. Obviously, a lot of these people don't have immediate value. These are guys that are going to be on your bench, plain and simple. Um, Adam Humphreys is probably the best of all of them, in my opinion, and perhaps even Mike Davis. I think if if and when they get rid of Jordan Howard, Mike Davis is going to have sneaky value. He's going to sit on your bench, sure. Tariq Cohen's going to get majority of the touches and the attempts and the snap percentage, sure. But Mike Davis can still be a consistent goal line back and can run between the tackles outside the tackles can contribute in the passing game so there's value hidden here you know it's just we have to get closer to that draft uh for the 2019 fantasy football season to kind of get an idea of where these guys are going to go anyway thank you everybody for watching i know there will be more information coming out later in the week when it comes to free agents if anything important comes up i'll let you guys know i'll bring out a video so if you haven't already click that subscribe button follow me on twitter uh like this video share and uh, I'll see you guys later this week, Thursday, either Thursday or Friday, Kirchhoff Podcast. So uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. And until next time, I'll see you guys. Peace.